I'm pretty sure that everyone who will watch this video will have heard of the term political correctness. It's almost an entry-level term for political discourse and everyone uses it. It's a term that's become even more popular recently. There was even a really high-profile debate with very public figures on whether political correctness is a good thing, and the idea has been discussed almost to death. But one way I don't see it being discussed is in the framework of the marketplace of ideas. I actually think the idea of PC falls into this framework fairly well, and I think it illuminates political discourse in the abstract, allowing us to have a unique look at what's actually happening when we talk about political correctness. So let's do that. Political correctness. Jumping right into the most political part of this discussion, we have to ask, what is political correctness? Now, to me, political correctness is a term that when everyone uses it in politics, just means nothing, and I'm going to show you why right now. The term in itself seems to be a status. Calling something politically correct might mean that it is in line with the political consensus. As a charge, it might be used to call someone's intentions into question. Calling someone politically correct might be a way to say that they, on their face, seem to be doing good, but only to appear that way that they are doing things cynically to appear good in the eyes of political authority. That's immediately what jumps out to me about the expression, but it's not used that way though. Now, talking about that very recent debate with public speakers, including the great Stephen Fry, where political correctness was defined by Fry in the following way. No, it's, it's interesting to hear that there really doesn't seem to be a problem, but yet I think we all instinctively know that there is some kind of a problem. There isn't censorship. Of course not, in, in the way that there is in Russia. I, and that's what I grew up with, political correctness, which meant that you couldn't say certain things on television. You couldn't say fuck, for example, on television, because it was incorrect to do so. It's so often people are saying, you see, I don't mind being called a faggot or a kike or whatever, or a mad person, because I've got mental health issues. I don't mind people insulting me. And people say, well, that's all right for you, Stephen, because you know you're strong. Well, I, I don't feel particularly strong, and I don't know that I like being called a faggot and a kite particularly, but I don't believe that the advances in my culture that have allowed me to marry, as I have now been for three years to someone of my gender, um, I don't believe they are a result of political correctness. And maybe political correctness is actually just some sort of live trout that the harder we squeeze it, the further it goes away. Um, but Russell Means, who was a friend of mine towards the end, who founded the American Indian movement, he said, oh, for God's sake, call me an Indian, or a Lakota Sioux, or Russell. I don't care what you call me. It's how we're treated that matters. Gay rights came about in England because we slowly and persistently knocked on the door of people in power. We didn't shout, we didn't scream. People like Ian McKellen eventually got to see the Prime Minister. And when the Queen signed in the royal assent, as she has to, for the bill allowing equality of marriage, she said, Lord, you know, I couldn't imagine this in 1953. Really is extraordinary, isn't it? Just wonderful. And I handed it over. Now, that's a nice story, and I hope it's true, but it's nothing to do with political correctness. It's to do with human decency. It's that simple. Now, that is different. He seems to define political correctness as politically active parties affecting speech on platforms, shooing away speakers who they deem to be harmful. At least given by the examples Fry gave. This specific use of the term is what I consider useless. When you get into particulars, for one, it absolutely is not a thing only one political side does. I think that's a point that has to be made. I remember during the Bush presidency when the term was not so specifically applied. In reference to Howard Stern, a popular American shock jock being censored for crude material by the FCC, a Washington Post article paints a centricity to anti-PC sentiments. And now, even though it's a cudgel to hit the left with, it's hilarious because political correctness is something the political right does all the time. All the time. That line in the song, quote, and we hate the popo, want to kill us in the street, fo show. Ah, please. Ah, I don't like it. So it transcends political party. That doesn't mean it's not a thing, right? Well, what we just described as political correctness isn't a bad thing. 
Not inherently, anyway. For one, it seems to be just how people express their opinions in media. We all collectively influence media. If no one cared about manly car chases, the Fast and the Furious franchise wouldn't be a thing. And at the same time, we don't want to watch a full-length feature film of a cat just being a cat. But that isn't a huge franchise, and no one's sinking money into that well. We all do political correctness on some level. It's just how we, in our small way, affect the marketplace of ideas. Secondly, the platform is key here. Political correctness as a term is meaningless without the platform, and this also means that the influence of political correctness is only as far as the influence of the group using it, usually in private industry. YouTube bans and the like, in this case, can be viewed as YouTube choosing to de-platform speakers in favor of the business from the group that is being politically correct. At the same time, no matter how much the left-wing PC brigade dislikes an internet personality, they can't get them banned from Breitbart. That site cares very little about business from that demographic. And at the same time as that, no matter how much the alt-right despise Anita Sarkeesian, she's not getting less popular. So we have an action that seemingly all sides of the political spectrum do. It seems to be simply group action in consequence to some perceived harm, and largely just the society engaging with ideas. So for the particular instances where it crops up, it's meaningless. It's just how the market is supposed to function. Although, perhaps, it means something in the abstract, and perhaps we can get a glance at that by looking at the economy of the marketplace of ideas. Free Market Principles Now that the politically charged bit is done with, into the economic philosophy. Now, the concept of the marketplace of ideas is more of a metaphor, really. Applying market-driven economics onto the immaterial commodities of ideas and concepts. Let's just pretend that everyone is a rational consumer. That we are provided with a market of every idea, and we, based on every factor we know of, select the best overall thing. In this way, the ideas that become the most popular and become mainstream are those ideas that are accepted by the most people and therefore the best. The best supply for the social demand. However, we have to be aware that society isn't monolithic. There isn't just one American people or one British people. At least not yet. Given that there are all these different groups that have different wants, different demands from their ideas, the supply becomes specialised. In the same way that certain items have specific target markets, like gender-specific items such as tampons or body-type-specific items like clothes, different groups of people who exist in different places collectively on the political spectrum or face different issues on a day-by-day -day basis will produce different sub-markets of ideas specific to their demands. Political correctness seems to just be the vehicle by which certain sub-markets reject certain ideas for their consumption, and the result seems very clear. Academia around the world is more and more left-wing, and think tanks, as well as private organizations, more and more right-wing. This affects different sections of a community like race as well. The real and honestly socially destructive effect is tangible when people from two different sub-markets interact, oftentimes with completely different sources and a completely different understanding of what certain words even mean. For me, as a card-carrying lefty, Antifa means anti-fascist and is not inherently violent or illegal. For the online right-wing, Antifa is an illegal and fascist organisation, so we end up not really being able to talk to each other. And because we can't talk, we end up unable to challenge each other. We end up in our very comfortable areas, rejecting any challenges to our comfort zone. And even though these free market principles were supposed to do away with crappy ideas like Nazism, well, they're not going away, are they? What's more, this disconnect is compounding. These sub-markets are becoming more and more cellular and having less permeability, and this is a real issue. Free market economics in general isn't really good at explaining this. In a free market model, access is all that's necessary. So long as an idea is available, and all these ideas are, the best idea would attract the most people, but that doesn't seem to be happening. Surely if a person is exposed to all ideas, then eventually the dominant idea would appear, and as far as political correctness goes, it's not totalitarian censorship. 
yet still it doesn't seem to matter. Though Mills isn't the only economist. Marxist Economics This kind of modeling of ideas is possible even in a Marxist model of the market. For Marxism, we can look at ideas as commodities, the use values of which is to satisfy the want for knowledge in a specific field. The exchange value is defined by a price commodity. In this case, we can say that it's platforming. We can evaluate the value of an idea in its exchange by how well it's platformed. Now, what do we mean when we say that? Well, when you trade something, you evaluate what that thing is worth in accordance to what you are trading it for. In this case, we use our ideas to get access to a platform and then apply that platform to buy another idea. This means various things. Looking at a material case for this kind of exchange, take a car for instance. Before that car reaches you for sale, it has to go through various stages of manufacture. You have to gather the raw materials, shape them into something useful, then put them together. All of that costs something. And if you sell your car at a value less than that cost, then you just lost money and have failed as a business. The cost of a commodity has to include all the costs of manufacture that aren't variable, the things you don't control. Labor, you do control. So, fuck it, pay people less. In this model, you get very much the same thing. The same submarkets form from the same disparity of wants, but now we can say that because of the deplatforming of ideas from opposing camps, we end up where we end up. Of course, you can say that ideas can be exchanged directly, but since this removes the standardizing value, you get a barter economy, and that's severely limited. We get the same centralization of commodities and the same cell structures forming. And in a Marxist model, when you have economic cells, it requires far more of the exchange commodity to properly supplement the exchanges and to evaluate the exchange value of certain ideas. Now Marx looked at these by class and by position in the production cycle. We're just modeling by political ideology that does change things a little bit, but for a Marxist model of economics, limiting the flow of ideas makes exchange more closed off and devalues currency. You need more money in the economy. Money, in this case, is platforming. And because of things like this, Marx recommended revolt. But for us, that doesn't really help any. What to do? Now we can see that in modeling the marketplace of ideas, there seems to inherently be a centralizing of certain ideas and language to certain spheres, driven by the collective application of choice in the marketplace and being what is referred to as political correctness. The answer seems to be, to me, that there should be communally actively driven cross-pollination of these sub-markets to enlarge where they interact. Say if you're a feminist, for instance, consider how that feminist model intersects with other groups. Intersectional feminism. That's a new thing, and I just invented it. Now, I also think there needs to be a place in this market where we expedite the exchange of ideas between groups that are directly opposed. I think we should all make these groups more permeable. But I wouldn't oppose, in any absolute terms, political correctness. I think there have to be some terms to the discourse, otherwise you're just inviting Nazis to the platform. And that should be defined from the bottom up. There shouldn't be legislation on what you can think. And if you get rid of political correctness, all the internet would be is people, yeah... I think all the internet would be is even more people yelling. Now, the last thing I want to do is to acknowledge what this is. It's an exercise in taking a metaphor to its most extreme. You can't really apply these principles here with 100% efficacy. For one, the marketplace of ideas, while a fun thought, requires people to rationally pick the ideas that will be most helpful without knowing what those ideas are. When the principle involves something material like a chair, it's obvious that you and I can rationally decide that the chair with no seat ain't gonna cut it. But for ideas... How do you do that? How do you rationally decide what this unknown idea is going to do and how it's going to satisfy your wants? Now, the Marxist model in particular has other problems. By far, the biggest weakness of the model is taking platforms as money. Money in a Marxist economy is the means of exchange. And while platforming makes sense in a few ways, it's hardly quantifiable. 
What's more, I only modeled political differences as the cause of political correctness and the subsequent centralization of ideas. It could very well be the other way around. Political parties might actively create these environments in various ways. It'd also be bad for me in a video like this not to point out that yes, there are times when people are needlessly aggressive to something harmless. Maybe that's what people mean when they talk about political correctness. Maybe that's what a lot of people personally think political correctness means. In that case though, the only thing to do is to make the point that yeah, banning Seinfeld stand-up is wrong-headed and silly. That's fine, just advocating that people aren't allowed to hold an opinion, to judge a person's ideas in any negative way, or that they have no right to actively voice that stance. That's a hell of a lot worse. A bigger thing for me though is that I'm modeling people to have collective differences, or at least in the way they experience society. If you think that's wrong, that's a whole other discussion, but I would just like to say that when we are talking about markets and market-driven forces, we necessarily are talking in terms of collectivism. To market a product, be that an idea or a chair, we have to think about who will buy it Anti-Semitism isn't popular among Jewish communities, but if it's popular for a different community, say it provides a convenient excuse for a sense of alienation, then it will be marketed, it will be platformed, and it will gain traction. Especially if that other community is larger than the Jewish community. The thing is, the ideas we accept and the ideas we are open to are defined, at least in part, by the ideas we are exposed to. So you kind of get this circulation of the same terrible ideas. Ideas like fascism and nativism. So while this video was cute and fun for me to do, commodifying thought, capitalizing on ideas, that's a very bad thing to do in my opinion. In the end, this is just a fun little thought experiment one that I thought might get people to look at things a little differently and maybe understand a little bit more about things from a Marxist model of commodities, which is a famously difficult topic to wrap your head around. Or maybe just see a ubiquitous idea like political correctness through a slightly different lens. If you think I got something wrong, please let me know in the comments. And if you think there's more to this or you have an alternative framework, I would actually love to hear it. Another final note just to practice what I preach, I have actually been engaging with young Randians on Twitter, mainly people like Mark Pellegrino, and, and I'm going to make a follow-up to this video, which will be an overview of that conversation, which I think was really helpful, specifically in wading through jargon that, that would typically just alienate us to and stop us from having a conversation. Now, please like this video if you like this video, and subscribe, because I need somebody to do that. I mean... I'm lonely. Going up. Must be for the visually impaired. How do you like that? A politically correct elevator. Third floor.